If you are a regular listener to America's Promise radio broadcast, would you today and for the next few days, next week especially, call Christian friends or relatives who might not know that the Bible has a lot to say about money, about debt, about economics, and so on, and tell them to listen to America's Promise radio broadcast on this station at this time. We're going to discuss some of these things about the Bible and money, things perhaps many Christian people never hear, although they may go to church for many, many years in the United States of America. Very few preachers know or will preach from the Bible about money and economics. They do exhort Christians to pay their debts, but they have no explanation from God's Word as to why this great Christian nation is in debt more than all the rest of the nations put together. Yes, brother, sister, the national and personal debt of this United States of America is more than all the other people upon the face of the earth. And why did it happen? How did it happen? Does the Bible have anything to say about it? And Lord willing, for today and during the next week, we're going to discuss this in the light of the Bible and what God has to say about it. Before we get into that Bible discussion, and while you're calling your friends and uh, telling them to listen to this broadcast, I'm going to list the April packet of literature, and we're going to do something just a little bit different this month. We're going to actually ask you to send an offering for this packet of literature, and I'll tell you how to get it. The announcer will give the address at the end of this broadcast, but for those who do not have it, it's America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, the zip code is 85010. And this month particularly, we're asking you to send an offering of at least $5 or more for this month's packet of literature. I'll give you some more reasons for that a little later. But you will receive these four books and tracks. My 50-page book, The Bible Says Russia Will Invade America. My 100-and-some page book, Why of coming soon, America without debt, crime, or war, the one that we'll be discussing to some extent on these radio broadcasts during the next few days, Why America Needs the Divine Law, which was written by one of the members of our church, and my open letter to any minister who preaches the Jews are Israel. And you cannot understand the monetary system in America unless you understand, of course, that we are the Israel people of the Bible, and I'll show you that as we go along. But first of all, since this is the month in which most people, at least when they, those who pay personal income tax, file their individual uh, federal income taxes, let us turn to the fifth chapter of Nehemiah and see if God in his mercy and his wisdom gave us a story of anybody who was ever taxed or is in debt as these Christian Americans in this end of the age. The fifth chapter of Nehemiah is part of the story of Ezra and Nehemiah coming back from the uh, captivity of Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and to reestablish the Judah kingdom under Ezra and Nehemiah. But they had trouble, they had problems, and much of it is given in just a handful of verses in Nehemiah 5. And brother, sister, you listen to their trouble and you see if it fits the problems in America today. Chapter 5 of Nehemiah. And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren the Jews. For there were that said, We, our sons, and our daughters are many. Therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. And their complaint was that they had to go to work for the Jews in order that they might have enough money to eat and live. Some also that were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. Now there's no indication that there was a drought in the Judah kingdom at that time or in old Canaan land. This dearth was a dearth of money, a lack of money. And brother, sister, in America today, our people are short of money, but they're not short of debt. They're in debt. And these men said, We've had to mortgage our lands, our vineyards, and our houses in order to buy things so we can continue to eat and live. 
They even said in verse 4, they also said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. They actually had to go in debt in order to obtain the necessary money to pay the taxes that the king had levied upon them. Now, this was the king of Babylon, of course. If you'll recall, they were still nominally part of the Babylonian Empire, and they had come back to the old Judah kingdom to rebuild Jerusalem under the edict of Cyrus, the Persian who was in command at that time of Babylon. All right, in verse 5, Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. In other words, we have lost control over our own children, and our children are literally as if they were the children of these people who oppress us, to whom we owe all this money, and, to whom, and from whom we have had to borrow and give them mortgages on our lands and our vineyards. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought into bondage already, neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. What a calamity upon this nation. These people had been forced by the economic system to go in debt to the extent that they realized they had actually sold the next generations, that's what the term they used, sons and daughters, they had actually sold the next generations into bondage. It's been some time since I have read in a newspaper by any of the so-called economic writers that this is literally true in America, but it is. We have gone so much in debt, both through the national government, also, also through state governments, and individually, that our children, at the moment they are born, are already in debt and can see that tens of thousands of dollars of their earnings, when they finally grow up and go to work, will be taken to pay the interest and the debts that we have obtained upon ourselves. We are already borrowing far, far into the future. In fact, we have arrived at a point in America today where the borrowing into the future is such that it, no one even talks about paying off the debts anymore. All they talk is about paying interest on them so that we can keep from foreclosure. And if you would add up the total federal debt, the total debt through the states, the school districts, the highway department, the various uh, metropolitan organizations that float bond issues, and the personal debt of the American people, we could not pay off our debt even if we gave the moneylenders title to the entire United States of America. The total debt now equals something over two trillions of dollars. Yes, over two trillions of dollars. How in the world did the United States of America, this great nation producing every year over 50% of the world's manufactured goods, a good share of the world's agricultural produce, and having the greatest technical society that has ever existed, and yet we can't seem to have enough money. Well, I suppose the people wondered at it at that time. And they said in these handful of verses in Nehemiah 5 that their position, their condition, was literally identical to what we find in America today. In verse 6, after they said this to Nehemiah, he said, I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and look who Nehemiah turned to to accuse of causing this situation. The nobles and the rulers in the nation. Who is at fault in America today? Is it the people who spend too much money? No, we don't buy and use even all the produce that we produce. In fact, billions of dollars of what the American manufacturer and the American working man and the American farmer produce are actually taken from us and sent to alien countries, much, much of it ending up in the hands of the enemies of America. So it's impossible to accuse the American people of using more or buying more than they should because they do not even buy their own produce. They give it away, it's taken from them, it's stolen, it is used for purposes against the best interests of the United States of America, 
And yet the economists and the writers in our newspapers often accuse our people, well, the reason you're in debt is you just want things that you can't afford. No, there's something deeper in this. There's something that is greater that the American people do not see. And we'll show you as we go along during the next few days, the main reason they don't see it is they have not been taught God's simple laws of economics from his holy word, and neither are they taught it today. Nehemiah, when this was brought to his attention, being a righteous, godly ruler, immediately turned to the source of the affliction, the nobles and the rulers, and said unto them, And here's the cause of it. Ye exact usury, every one of his brother, and I set a great assembly against them. What is the cause of this? One thing, interest on money. We have a financial system operating in America that has become our official monetary system that is based on debt and usury. It's not based on the dollar. It's not based on gold. It's not based on the number of people we have. It's not even based on the amount of production that we can get from our factories and from our farms. It is based solely on debt and interest. And Nehemiah recognized that that's what had happened to his people. He said to these nobles and rulers, ye exact usury. That means you charge interest on money. And in some translations, especially those uh, of the old ones, such as the Septuagint, they do not use the term usury. They use the term interest, because that's exactly what it means. Ye exact interest, every one of his brother. And I said a great assembly against them. And I said unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And we will ye even sell your brethren, or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace, and found nothing to answer. These men cannot answer the charge from a righteous man when he tells them, ye charge interest on money. And that's what we're going to talk about during the next few days. And in fact, that is what this one book is about. Coming soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War. Because I show in this book the situation we find ourselves in today. And then I show from the Bible that God Almighty has promised His Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, and kindred peoples, the literal, physical descendants of the tribes of Israel, to release them from this bondage of debt and interest. Just in the same manner, literally, as we see that Nehemiah released those people, which we'll read on the next broadcast during the next few, reading the next few verses. All right, I'll repeat again. Those who send an offering of five dollars or more will receive these four books and tracts. The Bible says Russia will invade America. Why America needs the divine law. Coming soon, America without debt, crime, or war. And my open letter to any minister who teaches the Jews are Israel. And brother, sister, I could almost challenge any one of my listeners to read those four books and not realize that we are that. Before we read the next few verses in the fifth chapter of Nehemiah, where we were reading on the last broadcast to show you Nehemiah's solution to his nation's debt problem, I want to read you just the first one or two paragraphs in my book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War. And I want to have you listen to this for a moment as it states very shortly in just a matter of a few words the situation in which America finds itself today. This is the beginning of the book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War. In the 20th century, the United States of America is easily seen as the wealthiest and most productive nation in the world, making efficient use of an abundance of natural resources and an intelligent and skilled labor force the United States now produces over 50% of the manufactured goods of the world each year. Similarly, our agri agricultural pro production is the envy of the world. And yet the American people who produce this vast store of wealth seem always to be short of money and in debt. American wives are working in unprecedented numbers. Husbands hope for overtime hours or take a second part-time job to help pay their bills. 
When the children reach college age, most of them must work part-time to pay their way, as the parents are unable to afford the added financial burden. At the same time, the American family must work more hours to survive. Its total debt climbs higher and higher, while the psychologists and family counselors say the major cause in America of family breakups and divorce is trouble over money and debt. Law officers say that many of our juvenile criminals are from such broken homes. Like our family and crime problems, most of the other difficulties facing America can be traced directly or indirectly to money. All right, then the rest of the book shows why all of this trouble and calamity has come upon us and what, it relation has, what its relationship is to money. Now, I read the first part of that because I wanted some of you people who see this, if you'll stop and think about it, to wonder, at least for a few moments, why you never hear ministers talk about this problem. Now, let me repeat just one paragraph of this that I read, and you read all of these troubles and these problems in your daily newspaper. The ministers preach about the problem, but they never give the source of it. Just think of this one paragraph on this money situation. At the same time, the American family must work more hours to survive. Its total debt climbs higher and higher, while psychologists and family counselors say the major cause in America of family breakups and divorce is trouble over money and debt. Law officers say that many of our juvenile criminals are from such broken homes. Yes, the ministers, the clergy, Christian people are always concerned about the symptoms, but they never get to the cause. Why do they not preach about money and debt from their pulpits? Well, of course, the answer to some extent is, if they preached about money and debt, it wouldn't take very much preaching before they would realize the only answer to this is two things. Number one, America has to go back and return to God's law. And number two, the reason for it is we are the Israel people of the Bible. There is no subject in the Bible that is more definitive in its proof of the Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, Germanic, and kindred people's identity as the house of Israel than our present economic system and our debt. As an example, I want to read, before we finish in Nehemiah, just two verses in Deuteronomy 28. For those who don't know their Bible very well, Deuteronomy 28 is the chapter in which Moses tells the Israel people of all the blessings that will come upon them if they obey God's laws, statutes, and judgments, followed by the information about the curses that would come upon them if they do not follow God's laws, statutes, and judgments. And now think about this a moment. This is only to the house of Israel. This is not told or not directed at any other people, and it is to the house of Israel only on one subject. Either you obey the law and be blessed, or you disobey the law and be cursed. And among other things, there are two verses, verse 43 and verse 44, that tell the Israel people what will happen to them if they, Israel, Turn away from God's laws, statutes, and judgments. Verse 43 and verse 44 of Deuteronomy 28. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Take a look at the United States of America today the stranger, the alien, the non-Caucasian, is rapidly taking rule over this nation, and what is he doing? He is lending us our own money for which we give him mortgages on our land and a claim against all future earnings of our children, just as Nehemiah was told by the people in old Judah kingdom that they had sold their sons and daughters into bondage. That he said... In verse 5 of Nehemiah 5, Our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, 
our children as their children. They literally own the next generations in America who will be working one, two, or three days a week for nothing more than to pay the interest on the money we were forced to borrow from these aliens and strangers who have gotten control of America's money system. Yes, there's a simple reason why ministers do not preach on money and debt. Because if you did, you would recognize that the only way the Bible makes any sense is that we are the Israel people and we're in debt because we've disobeyed the great God Almighty. All right, let's go back to Nehemiah 5 before we go any further in my book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War. And let's see what Nehemiah did after he went to the rulers and the elders and rebuked them and told them, You have charged interest on money. In verse 9 he says, Also I said, It is not good that, that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? In other words, why don't you men realize that we should walk after God's laws, statutes, and judgments because of all these enemies that we've got around this nation? Remember, Nehemiah was literally in the same position as our early colonists when they first came over here. And we ended up fighting the greatest nation at that time in military terms, Great Britain, in order to get our own independence. And we had Indian savages and the other nations of the world who were not necessarily our friends. And Nehemiah said to them, We have enemies all around us. Don't you know you should walk in the fear of God? I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. He repeated it again, a double witness by Nehemiah here, that the only thing that had caused all of this trouble and this crying, this debt, this mortgaging, this forcing to borrow money even to pay the taxes to the king was caused by one thing, usury, interest on money. And brother, sister... I could almost challenge you to find in the local area here where we have our church any other minister in the state of Arizona except Pastor Sheldon Emery who will tell you that charging interest on money is a crime against God Almighty. In fact, I get many Christian newspapers and uh, we have local churches here doing the same thing. They're always urging people to give them money and they'll pay the people interest on the money. And here we see this good godly Nehemiah recognize the trouble, everything that had happened to that little Judah kingdom in its attempt to rebuild into a great nation had been caused, or their trouble had been caused, by one thing, charging interest on money. He told them, I pray you, let us leave off this usury. And then he went further. Restore. Restore. The great story of the Bible that God is going to do to his Israel people is contained in one word. Restoration. In the days of restoration. Now restore means to place a people or something back in a condition that had been in, in some previous date. And so Nehemiah said, all right, we're going to take care of this situation. We're going to get our people out of trouble. We're going to stop not only charging interest, but we are going to restore, give back, put the property back in the hands of the people. Verse 11, Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money, and of the corn, the wine, and the oil that ye exact of them. And some day in America, as you might guess from the title of my book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War, there is going to be a day of restoration when the American people who have lost their homes, their farms, their places of business, their literally their livelihood and their children are going to have it restored to them. But that restoration will come only when we turn to God and believe His Word and turn and obey Him. And by obeying God, I mean obeying His law. 
How in the world are you going to obey God if you won't obey the things he had stated in his Bible are his law? Now, laws are made either to be obeyed or to be broken. If you don't obey them, you break them. And you ministers and you Christians who cast aside the law of the Lord and refuse to obey it, well, you're breaking God's law. You're sinners. You're violators in the sight of God. And you, many of you, will be cast out of his kingdom when the kingdom is cleansed and the day of restoration comes upon us. In verse 12, then said they, We will restore them and re will require nothing of them, so will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priest and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. And I shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise, even thus be he shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did according to this promise. Quite a story. In 13 verses in Nehemiah 5, and it literally is a word picture story of the United States of America today. We have sold our children into bondage to the money lenders, and it makes sense only if you understand we are God's Israel people. We have defied God. We have turned away from Him. We have broken His laws, statutes, and judgments. And now coming upon us as a people are the things listed in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy under not the blessings, but the curses. All right, this is Pastor Sheldon Emery, and we'll continue this study on money and debt and interest tomorrow and for a few more days, Lord willing. Meanwhile, all of those who write and ask for the April packet of literature and send an offering of $5 or more. We're going to test you this month to see whether you're willing to part with a little of this money for some of the writings on God's Word. You will receive the April packet, my book, The Bible Says Russia Will Invade America, which has 50 pages, Why America Needs the Divine Law by Brother Snook, which has 32 pages, my book, Coming Soon, America Without Dead Crime or War, a little over 100 pages, and my open letter to any minister who teaches the Jews are Israel. So you write, send of your tithes and offerings that we may continue to broadcast. Until tomorrow, goodbye. God bless you and Christian America. It is very possible that I have listeners who have attended Christian churches for many years who may feel that any pastor is getting far afield from the Christian gospel when he's talking about money in the light of God's word. But according to the book of Proverbs, in chapter 18, verse 13, it says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So I would beg that you listen and find the reasons why Pastor Emery is telling you that God's word has a lot to say about money, about economics, about debt, and so on, and why we should, as God's people, claiming the name of Christ, claiming that we're Christians, should understand what is happening in this great Christian nation regarding money, economics, and so on. So I'm going to read just a few pages again in my book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War to show you how very simple the situation is regarding our money and economics and how easily it could be rectified if we would turn to the word of the Lord. So first I'm going to read just two paragraphs in one of the chapters in this book showing the necessity for money. Now some of you people may think that this is wrong for a Christian to talk about money. But Christian civilization could not exist as we know it without money. It is one of the requirements of civilization. So let me read you just these two paragraphs to show you that, and then you perhaps will understand why we, as Christians, seeking the wisdom of God, should find God's word and God's wisdom on this thing which we require in order to live. Just two paragraphs in this book, the subtitle is Adequate Money Supply Essential. Quote, Civilization as we know it could not exist without an adequate and even an abundant supply of money. Modern society could forego many other rather important things, but without an adequate supply of money, 
our industries would slow down to a halt, our farms would recede to become self-sustaining family units, surplus food would disappear, many jobs requiring the work of more than a few men would go undone, and the purchase and transportation of large volumes of goods would cease. Within a very short time, unemployment would lead to starvation, and mobs of hungry people would plunder and kill in order to remain alive. Civilization would return to the Dark Ages, and all government except family or very small groups would cease to function. An overstatement? Not at all. Money is the means of all commercial trade except simple barter. It is the measure and the instrument by which one product is sold and another purchased. If we were to abolish money, or even to reduce it below the amount necessary to sustain current trade, the results would be catastrophic. For an example of such an event, we need only look back to the depression of the early 1930s in America. All right, that just takes two paragraphs in this book, and I believe that any Christian who has his wits about him should see that if money is that important to civilized society, God Almighty, in his wisdom, must have given us some rules and regulations, some law and order for a money system. And of course he did, but strangely enough, there isn't one Christian out of a hundred that knows it's in the Bible. Now on another page, I have some comments to make about the depression of the 30s. And for you older people, this will be just be reminding you of things which you already know. And for those you have, who have not thought about it, I want to demonstrate to you that it was only the lack of money which caused the depression. It had little to do directly with preaching or not preaching, except for the fact that the preachers did not preach about money. If they had in the previous 50 years, we would not have suffered the depression that we did. But you listen, this is only just a few paragraphs, actually less than two pages in this 104-page book. And you listen, and you see whether this pastor, Emre, who wrote this book, which of course is myself, knows what he's talking about, about the depression. Many of you will recognize or be able to recognize whether this is true or false by just listening to it. The subtitle is The Banker's Depression of the 1930s. During the Depression years of 1928 to 1939, our country did not lack industrial capacity, fertile farmland, skilled and willing workers, or industrious farm families. We had the most extensive and efficient transportation system in the world. In the previous 100 years, we had outstripped all other nations in railroads, road networks, and water transportation. Our communication systems between regions and localities were the best in the world, utilizing telephone, teletype, radio, and a then well-operated government mail system. No war had ravaged our cities or countryside for more than 60 years since the Civil War, which in any case was largely confined to the South. No pestilence had weakened our population, nor had famine ravaged the land. The United States of America in the 1930s lacked only one thing, an adequate supply of money to carry on trade and commerce. How had this happened? Quite simply, bankers, the source of America's money and credit, had deliberately withheld $8 billion from circulation by refusing additional loans to stable and growing industries, stores, and farms. At the same time, they demanded payment on existing loans so that money was rapidly taken out of cir circulation and was not replaced. The almost immediate shortage of money which followed brought on the Great Depression and America was in trouble. Goods were plentiful and available to be purchased. Jobs were waiting to be done, but there was very little money. Twenty-five percent of the workers were laid off their jobs in less than two years. Bankers who had deliberately caused the Depression then foreclosed on tens of thousands of farms and businesses. Gloom settled over America, and the people blamed everybody but the real culprits for their trouble, just as they do today. The Great Depression lasted until 1938 and 1939, unemployment remaining at more than 20% until 1939, when the United States government began spending large amounts of money 
putting it into circulation for military preparedness for ourselves and for our future allies in Europe. Just as soon as the money supply became available, our people were hired back to work, farmers sold their produce instead of plowing it under, mines reopened, factories began to hum, and industrial and residential construction began anew, and the Great Depression was over. Some politicians were blamed for it, and others took credit for ending it. The truth is that lack of money caused it, and an adequate supply of money ended it. The American people were never told this simple truth, and the control of our money supply remained in the hands of the millionaire bankers. End of quote. Less than two pages showing you the very simple truth that the suffering and the breakup of families, the suicides, the destruction of the home that took place in the Depression was caused by one thing, lack of an adequate supply of money. And, brother, sister, it's about time the ministers in America began to realize that the calamities brought upon this nation because of our finances and our debts is, has an answer in God's holy word, and it's about time we should be turning to it. For those who will write and send an offering of $5 or more, this book will be included with the other books that we'll be sending out as the April Packet of Literature. Perhaps some of you people, as you pay the tremendous taxes that you pay on your income and, uh, then, and those that are withheld from you during the week when you work, will begin to realize that one of the main reasons for this is because of the debt that our nation has, our states have, our local governing bodies, all the way from the county, the city, and the school board, right down to the individual who has allowed his politicians to borrow into circulation practically every dollar that is available to the American citizen. The bankers receive from us tribute, usury, on practically every dollar that goes into circulation in America. And today, you people work almost one day out of five to pay nothing more than the interest on the money that has been borrowed on bonds all the way from your local school district right up to the United States government. What have you become? You have become slaves of the money changers. The same people, the same system that Jesus Christ drove out of the temple back in old Jerusalem. And, of course, the book goes into that, too, and shows you what those people were doing and why Jesus Christ, the only time in his physical life upon the earth, used violence against other people, that violence was against the money changers. And today, the ministers who claim the name of Christ are almost 100% silent on who the money changers are and what they are doing to America. We'll have a Bible study here in just a day or so, and we're going to go right through the laws, statutes, and judgments on the Bible, or in the Bible, on God's Word, on what He has to say about money. I will say this, I will not be able to cover all of these details on the radio broadcast, of course, unless I were to sit here day after day after day telling you what the situation is. You are going to have to be willing to study God's Word as a Bible study in the privacy of your own home using books such as those written by myself and other men as your guide. In other words, this book tells you what the current situation is. It tells you how we got in this situation, what our forefathers wrote about this, and what the Bible says is both the cause and the solution of the financial dilemma which is destroying the United States of America. And brother, sister, I would have you understand that money rules the government of the United States of America today. Yes, the people who control the money system in America control your government, both internal and foreign policy. If you do not understand the money system, you cannot understand what is happening to these people in America, these Israel people who have come under the judgment of God, and we are now fulfilling verses 43 and verses 44 of Deuteronomy 28 and also many other verses that are related to it. Lord willing, tomorrow we'll continue this. You write, send five dollars or more, and we'll send you this book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War. Also, my book, 
The Bible says Russia will invade America, and this is directly com- connected with this, both through the present current events as we see Russia building this great armada for this invasion, and it's also prophesied in the Word of God. Also, my uh, 32-page booklet, an open letter to any minister who teaches the Jews are Israel. As long as you think the people who call themselves Jews are the Israel people of the Bible, you will not understand why America is suffering the calamities that were prophesied for Israel when Israel turned away from God's law. You cannot understand even the money system unless you understand who we are. We are Israel, God's chosen people. Another 32-page booklet, Why America Needs the Divine Law, and this was written by Dr. Franklin Snook, who is a member of our congregation. It's 32 pages. It is one of the best written booklets I have ever seen showing what happens when we obey the law as a people and as a nation and what happens when we do not. Page after page showing the uh, problems America faces and then giving the scripture verses where God has given the solution for those problems in his law, statutes, and judgments. This is Pastor Emery. you listen in again tomorrow. Until then, goodbye, God bless you, and Christian America.